Anyway, uh, on, yes, okay, brilliant. So, hello, uh, it's great to be back. Um, I'm kind of, uh, you're probably sick of seeing me here. Um, but today I'm going to talk about something uh, hopefully interesting, which is writing beautiful packages in Go. About me, this, oh, for that's wrong side. That was meant to, yeah. So yeah, this, I, and my jacket does come off. This, someone said, I've never seen you without a jacket on, but obviously no one's born with a built-in jacket, so I shouldn't need to explain that. So, uh, right, what are we going to talk about today then? Well, we're going to talk about uh, packages and libraries and, uh, and, and, and really kind of understanding what we really mean by this stuff. Um, a, for those that don't know, a package in Go is a, basically a folder full of Go files, um, hopefully with test files too. They can be imported into other projects. Uh, we're not talking about commands, you know, we're talking about things that you import to help you use, uh, help do something, solve some other problem for you that, that you, hopefully somebody else has written for you, you know. Um, but you, you also um, hopefully open source these as well. And that's kind of uh, part of the whole kind of Go ethos, since it's an open source project itself. It's great to, um, to you know, contribute if you can, and, and, and uh, I'm going to hopefully cover some, um, some practices and some things that we can, uh, we can do to, to write these beautiful packages that everyone's going to want to use. So what do we really mean then? What is a, a beautiful package? Well, yes, it's quite tough to define it, in fact. They're elegant and simple. You know, the very familiar feeling. Um, might be obvious, you know, when you look at it, when you just glance at the, the, the API, it's, it should be quite obvious what it's going to do. Um, you, you hopefully already know how to use it just by kind of looking at it, you know. We can just be self-similar as a Go community, and if we do that, uh, it gives us a kind of head start when we jump into actually working on these. And there are packages that I look forward to using, um, and some that I don't. And therefore, I think there's, we can say that Packages are better than others um, in some ways, and we can look at why that is and, and, and talk about it. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to like show terrible packages or anything, don't worry. Um, so when you come to write a package then, motivation is, is one, of the, uh, one of the things to think about from the beginning, I think. Um, don't write packages for the sake of it. It's very tempting, and sometimes we want to do it for fun. And do, if you want to do it for fun, do it. But but really, the, the, the best packages are ones where you solve your own problem. You're solving something you need, um, uh, and you're not kind of guessing. You're not doing something assuming this is, you know, someone's going to have this problem, so I'm going to preempt it. Um, it's tough to get that right, and you know, it's more difficult. So. Um, and if you have a pr big project, and you think, OK, here's a little piece of our thing that we need, but the open source community probably going to appreciate it too. Um, then keep it internal to start with, I would say. Really get it battle tested when you're happy with it. You'll learn so much just by doing that um, that, that it's going to be a better package once it's, once it's ready to go. Um, and you know this, the, the Web 2.0 movement gave us these gorgeous websites um, that are very easy to use and you know, the information's at the top that you need, and you can f easily find other bits of information by drilling down and all this. This was this whole kind of web 2.0 movement. Um, and it's kind of started with people thinking about user-centered design, things like this. So they started to build personas, a bit like as Steve was talking about in the keynote, starting to think about users really quite obsessively. And not just what they're, they're trying to do, but how they're feeling about using the software and, and and um, you know what their goals are and what their their motivations are, and um, you know packages in Go and really any language, they are they have an API. You know they have an interface, um, and although we think of them as running in production at scale by you know and it's machines calling calling them, well really they're not. They they are used by humans initially, right? That's us. We're the humans that I'm talking about. So that this user-centered design applies directly to 
uh, writing packages, I think. So we should think about the same way. So think about who's using the package. What are they trying to do with it? Uh, and in what context are they using it? Is it, is it something that's foundational to a project, so you're going to spend a lot of time with it in the beginning and then you won't touch it? Is it something they're just using testing or debugging? Um, is it a package that they're going to call throughout the code? It's going to be scattered everywhere. You know, those thinking about that and the use and where your package is going to be, uh, that, that I think is, is pretty vital when it comes to your design. Too far. I was in Spitalfields Market once, and one of the market vendor guys said to me, he came really close, a bit too close, and said, I like specific things, which is the best sentence I've ever heard, and told me nothing about him. But yeah, it likes specific things, which is fine. So let's get into some specific things about packages. Smaller footprints, I think, are better. I think we can say, you know, the, uh, and by footprint, I mean, you know, the number of exported things. Um, if you type IOUtil dot in most IDEs, you will get a list of what's available to you. And if that list is like this, you can just see it all in one go, then that's pretty good. You know, we can see what's available in the package. We know what to do with it. Um, you, you can't always do that. Sometimes the packages are going to grow, you know, but the goal, I think, should be to drive towards smaller footprints if we can, just so that it's easier. And of course, narrow types are simpler. So in this case, um, I have this write JSON line, and I'm taking a file. It's going to take an object and write, marshal it as JSON and save it in a file. Um, but this top one can only write to a file. Whereas if we change that, and you know, since a file is an IO writer as well, if we use IO writer instead, uh, suddenly we can write to all kinds of different things that, that support IO writer. Um, it can still use the file, but now we can also do it to a, a buffer, and so we can not marshal stuff in memory now. We can do it to an HTTP response writer. That's a writer too. Um, uh, and, and therefore, it works in servers now. And we can also use, uh, since the standard library and other packages um, use these, these basic interfaces, you can use those too. So we can now, I can zip it easily. So it's things like that, thinking about narrow, narrow types. And sometimes, especially in this case, actually, you may only have changed the signature. You probably, depending on what your code's doing, you wouldn't even notice, apart from obviously I've changed the variable name, but otherwise the code probably inside it might just remain the same. So it's literally just a, uh, you know, thinking about it uh, from that perspective. And uh, it's worth seeking out single method interfaces of your own as well. Um, single method interfaces are, they, they, they're so much better than even two. Two methods is better than having three, it's simpler, but there's something special about just one method in an interface in Go. And your code that you, the packages that you write, and uh, you know, you probably can find these yourself, these, these modeling these concepts in this way. And if it's only got one method, then it's easier to implement. And that's the point of an interface. We want people to implement them, right? We want our users to implement these interfaces. And then, of course, there's, uh, there's things you can do if it's only a single method. This, basically, this slide is in every talk I do. I, I, I still love this. I can't, I can't get over it. I won't explain it, because you probably already know. But Google it if you don't know, um, or search from you know, a different provider. Lots of search engines available, just for balance. Bing, uh, Ask Jeeves, is that still a thing? Uh, I think that's it. So yes, basically, we can have function adapters for single method interfaces. You can't do that if there's two methods. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so then instead of a type, you just have a function. So it's simpler and more versatile. And you can kind of do quirky stuff like this. This is real code. This is a uh, status handler. And it's a type that, that just is based off int. And it implements the serve HTTP method. So it's an, it itself is an HTTP handler. So you can use it. You can map it in your roots and things. And this just, re just responds to a request with a, an HTTP status code. So then you can do a not found handler just by casting an int to uh, that type. You know, things like that. And this is just HTTP handlers as an example. If, you, if you've discovered your own single method interfaces in your own contexts, 
Users can do things like this, and you can, um, you know, with, with kind of little, little or no effort, which is awesome. So structure, structuring packages as well, structuring the code properly. And what do we really mean by that? Um, well, I think when, when it comes to uh, deciding if you're going to use a package, what I do is generally I'll scan the list of files first. And if there's one file, then I get the sense this is a kind of small package. It could still be massive, because there's nothing stopping you having loads of stuff in that file. Um, but we try, try not to do that. We try and, and break things up and, and group them a little bit um, better. There's a quote there from uh, David Hernandez. I always like to pronounce his name as if it's one word for some reason. David Hernandez. It seems to be better. I don't know. Perhaps you'd like to consider changing it. Um, uh, so he said the first place... I won't do his voice. It's, it'd be racist. He says the first place I look when considering using a package are test files. And this is kind of cool, right? If you have a package and, you, and it's open source and you want people to use it, they're going to look at that and see, well, is, you know, what's really the quality of this? How, you know, how good is this package? And if it doesn't have any tests, you sort of, even if it's simple and you've tested it yourself and you know it works and it's brilliant, still, you want, you want to give people confidence. You want to, uh, you know, they don't want to be worrying about this, this little thing that they're using. Um, so subfolders in the project as well. And we might as well be similar to uh, things that are emerging because it's, it's simpler and familiar and it's kind of important to, and worth going for. So commands go into CMD, packages, test data. You know, don't, don't have a folder called some, like, um, I don't know, a different name for test data, right? It seems now test data, that's the name where we, that's where we put our test data. So let's just do that. It's fine. It works. Great. Um, and you never know, sometimes these patterns and things might even become official, a bit like, you know, the vendor package and we have like internal uh, as a folder. You know, it really it explains what the code is just, just by glancing at it. Um, there's a link here for a, uh, a great article that actually goes into these. Um, it's Rackle. I'll just pronounce the name. Um, and there's a couple of things. So use multiple Go files, you know, let's... Break it by responsibility. If you've got a user type, um, pop, it, pop it in a users.go file at the top, and then user-related things underneath it. Start with most relevant at the top and go down to least relevant. That, just as a general rule, makes sense, because if you think about going to a, a new project and you think, oh, I, I, I want to know what this uh, user type is, I need to figure, just figure something out, um, where are you going to look? Probably a users.go file. So in there, um, uh, that's where you should be. You know, there's no reason to get kind of creative at that level. We might as well go for um, being similar. Another thing I would say for package writers is to leave concurrency to the user. Um, we naturally want to make the package as useful and as awesome as possible, and we want to do concurrency because it's fun and cool and go. But it's not always obvious that what's happening, and being obvious is is pretty vital, I think. So, so here's this function: do amazing thing. Inside that, it's going to go off and do the amazing thing, um, and that might make perfect sense. Now, we might want to document that to say, you know, oh, this is going to run background task, or maybe we change the name so it's start, so it's clear that it's starting something. But actually, you take away uh, something from the user which is the option to use it as a blocking function, which they may want to do. Um, if, if you, they can always do this themselves, right? They can always manage the concurrency on their end, and they'll know it's going to happen, rather than it being magic and inside the package. Um, and then, like I said, they can use it in a blocking way too. So they have, then they have both options. So if it, unless you've got a great reason for doing it, which is uh, most of these, in fact, all anytime you, there's a rule, there's always a, a great reason why you would break that rule. So absolutely, that does still apply. But I'm just talking kind of generally, right? Let's leave concurrencies, leave, leave concurrency to the user. Hopefully, you're the first user of the package. This is, speaks a little bit to building something that you need rather than trying to kind of guess and and just do something because you want to or because it's fun. Um, but 
But if you are the first user, real user, it's going to be a better package. And there's some things you can do to help hammer that home. One of them is test-driven development. I don't think there's a more boring task than writing unit tests for code that already exists. I can't be bothered to do that for some reason. I, I, I can't, I'm, not, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Right? But when I'm writing those tests, like as at the same time that I'm writing the package, when I'm doing it TDD style, I, I'm very happy to write those tests. So that's, that might be a personal thing for me, but I know for sure that um, t you know, test-driven development, it drives up the uh, code coverage that you get um, and also helps you think about, since, since you're writing a test, you sort of start to use the package before it really exists, so you're already thinking, ah, so how would I, want, how would I expect this to be used or what would be the simplest way to do this? And you get to have that kind of conversation. You also know, you're aware of the API footprint from the very beginning, which is very important too. Uh, follow conventions and, you know, be similar, let's be similar to each other in, in code. Yeah, in code. Don't everyone, like, recede your hairline. I'm not saying you have to be similar to me in that way, but don't tell about that. Uh, we, can, we can edit this after, right? That's still a thing we can do. Uh, if so, put some more hair in for me. <laughs> okay, don't talk about hair. Rule one, isn't it? Broken it. <laughs> no. Uh, don't surprise people, either. Um, you know, it's, we do want to be creative and, and show off that we're smart and cool. Don't. Make it boring, make it obvious, because actually you can be creative in different ways that actually end up mattering a lot more. So be obvious, not clever. Some, write some jokes now, guys, you ready? This one I actually did write. The three hardest things in coding are naming things, invalidating the cache, and invalidating the cache. No? That's what I thought, dead silence. <laughs> For anyone at home watching this on, on YouTube later, uh, the, the audience isn't mic'd up, so if it's deadly silent after I do a joke, that's just because, you know, they, they, you can't hear it, but they're absolutely loving it. <laughs> Brilliant. We can put a sound in too. Another one. Ha three hardest things in coding are naming things, off by one errors. Yeah, pathetic. Not doing it. I'm not, I'm not doing jokes again. <laughs> not worth it. It's embarrassing. But in both of these jokes, you will notice that the harder, you know, number one in both of these cases is naming things. And that is kind of key. So let's think about, again, from a user's point of view, um, remember that the package name is part of the API. Here's an example. We have a uh, brew t function. You know, this is how you know, we write code like this inside the package. It makes sense. We're, we're going to brew some tea. Uh, we're going to take a steep time and uh, return an error. <laughs> yep. Because you can. You can burn yourself or don't have enough hot water. I don't know. So, uh, but from the outside, we, to, to use that, you say t.brew t. And so we get a bit of redundancy. It's enough to say t.brew. And so, again, think about it from the user's perspective. t.brew makes perfect sense. And it's much nicer, I think. So ex what do I mean then by expose yourself to the API footprint from the beginning? This is really, um, uh, TDD helps to do this, you know. When you press dot and see that little list, that's really, I think, sometimes it, that's all the documentation you need. For good packages, you only need to see that and it's quite obvious what you're going to do. Um, some cases are more difficult and you need, you know, more, there's a lot more types or the concepts are harder to model, whatever. Uh, so totally fine. But there's things we can do to, to help in this way too, which is one of them is uh, to put test code in a different package. So in the same folder still, but use the underscore test uh, package name. And what that does is it means that you have to, in order to call the methods and use the types from your package, you have to use the package name and you have to import it. Uh, so you get to see how people are going to use this. Again, you get to see that directly as you're kind of writing it. Um, and you can use GoDoc early too. If you do GoDoc, HTTP, 8080, whatever, it will 
on localhost 8080, it will give you the Godoc thing, but with loads of extra packages, basically everything you've, you've go-getted. Could be that. But also the package you're working on. You can see that too and, and kind of refresh it um, and, and get a sense of that footprint as well for your package. Because that's really what, remember, that's the first thing people are going to see probably when they, if they're considering using your code. Um, and this isn't all about open source. This, all, this, all this stuff applies to your own internal packages as well. Um, you know, you, having, you, you, your future self is also going to use the package. Um, as well as your teammates and things like this. Uh, so it all applies still. But it's especially true, I think, with, uh, with open source. Uh, don't log stuff out of a package. It's, it's annoying. Uh, or or, or make, it, uh, make it a dependency or something you can control to turn it off. For debugging, and maybe even for your own case, you definitely want those log statements there. But, but not everyone does, or they might do logging differently. Or, you know, um, and you sort of take away that control by by just logging things directly. So avoid that, I would say. Make zero values useful. This applies everywhere, but um, it's quite nice. So I have this greeter type here. And you can see the greet method checks to see if the format's empty. And if it is, uses a default format. Um, and that means we can, we can use the types just by you know, declaring it and, and get on and use it. So we say hi to Dean by just creating a greeter uh, without having to actually do anything, but then also we can we can control it. Um, you know, so zip, you know, think about that too. What's the what's the behavior of this by default? This extends to even um, if if your code is going to connect to say NSQ, then then NSQ has default ports and things that it will listen to. Um, so just you have them as the default, right? It makes sense. So you can just start NSQ, run the thing, and it sort of works without having, you having to do those extra cognitive steps. If you can avoid constructors, do. Um, and the reason for that is, if you look at this, we have this, we're creating a brewer here to brew some more tea. And, um, uh, but in the top example, we don't know what's happening. We can't really be sure. What's being allocated? Uh, is it kicking off Go routines? Um, we'd have to go and look at the code if we, if we want to find out about that. Versus the second one, which basically, it's a bit more typing. So, you know, generally we'll think we want to help our users by not making them type too much, so we'll do the top one. But the second one's actually a lot clearer look. You know that you're creating a, a brewer, that's what you're allocating. You're setting the steep time. Before, you sort of had, you'd have to know the argument name to see what that, what that two minutes means. Um, uh, and, and you know that no Go routines are starting. It's not doing anything else. Magic, you've got it there. So if you can do that, I think that's a good practice to do. Um, plus, you shrink the API footprint, because you then don't need that extra function to create the thing. Now, again, sometimes you know, you've got 10 channels you've got to create, and some maps and stuff, and it would be a pain to expect users to do that. Then Cool. Do a constructor. Avoid it if you can, I would say. Don't automatically add interfaces. Yeah. This, you know, again, we think we're going to, we want this interface. We've found maybe it's a single method interface and we love it. Um, or maybe it's just something that we want other people to implement, you know, uh, as, as, as this it grows this, and grows in success and popularity, this package. But we don't need to add that interface necessarily. Uh, so don't automatically do it. Here's an example. We have the greeter again, and we have a format greeter. Well, we kind of don't really need both of those. Um, and it's not going to be obvious when a, someone starts to use this, what they, which one they use. Um, you know, they could easily try and create a, this greeter type and things. Um, so, so it's about shrinking the API footprint. If you do want to keep the interface, you could actually not expose the other one. Don't expose the, the structure, the, the actual implementation, but have a function that creates that, and you can kind of keep your types internally. And this is nice, because then you have a greeter interface only. There's uh, a, and a function that returns a greeter, but it happens to do, you know, um, it happens to be greet using a format. But you could have other types, or other people could add them later. 
So yes, use Go like names. This is a thing. I have seen code where somebody's done a port from, say, Java or uh, Ruby, and uh, you end up with very big method names, and it's you know it's kind of really telling you exactly everything that's going on. Go doesn't really have that style. It tend, we tend to prefer s smaller and more succinct uh, examples. Um, one example I saw online was uh, like Marshall with indentation could be just you know and is Marshall indent. You know, simple tells you enough without um, properly you know ex over explaining. And similarly, like tear down, you might be doing something that's going to tear something down, but maybe, maybe we just use close, because close as a concept we have. Uh, there's even an interface uh, closer. So, you know, maybe that makes sense. Ask the user for HTTP client. If you are making HTTP requests, let the user provide the client. They can control it. Um, and in some cases, if you didn't do this, like on App Engine, you can't make requests using the default client on App Engine. You have to ask for a, a new a client from the URL fetch package. So you actually prevent your code from being able to run in App Engine just because you know you're make, kind of making that decision about the HTTP client. By all means, you know make the zero make the default useful. So default to the default client if you like, but uh, let the user give you their client context. Probably should be the first argument. If you're going to have context, have it as the first argument. I did see an example somewhere where there were a few arguments and context was just one of them and it kind of just felt weird. So I put this slide in there. Um, yes, don't mess with the global state, please. So don't add flags, even though that might make perfect sense and you might think, well, in every case when someone's going to use my package, it's going to be in a command, and these are flags that are standard and, and all that. There's probably some great reasons why you'd want to do it, but I think it's better to avoid it because uh, it sort of just pollutes things and it has some surprising side effects. Similarly, if you can avoid init as well, you know, it, it, can, be, it can definitely be misused, init, um, and really it's, it's just not clear to, the, to uh, somebody what's going to happen, and really being clarity and being obvious and things are uh, sort of the, the goal. Um, and don't mess with anything in the standard library. For example, there was a, uh, something which set a timeout in the default client. It, it added a timeout, so it changed the default client, or something like this. It did something uh, you know, which made sense in that, in that one context, but just by importing a package, suddenly you've changed something, and, and you're going to have kind of strange side effects, potentially. So. Avoid side effects and magic, and be obvious and clear. Sub packages are just packages. We did Vice, and um, originally we had this test package. It's an interface test, so it's basically a, um, a, a function that you call in test code, and it, it, it tests against the interface, it, but it tests an implementation. So, you know, if, if you want to write an implementation for Vice, as long as these tests pass, then it's okay, it's good, it can go in. Um, which is a cool little thing if you, if you are exposing an interface and you want, uh, you want people to write implementations. That's a nice way to help them do that. Um, but we had, uh, if you look at the import path, it's vice slash test. So in that context, it's very clear what that is. But in the code, suddenly it's just, the package name is just test. So you're saying test.transport, and it's like, not sure what that is anymore. So we changed it to vice test. So there's a bit of redundancy now in the import path which is part of the user experience. So we, you know, we want that to be nice and succinct and simple. And there is a little bit there, but it's probably worth it because now in the function bodies, we say vice test dot transport. Very clear and, uh, and very obvious. Come up with a good name for your packages. And you can be a bit creative here, but also make sure it's kind of clear what it is. Vice isn't a great example of this, um, uh, but you know, coming up with names that are going to be easy, to, quick to type, and because, um, you know, package name, remember, is gonna, they're going to use that throughout the code. So these names should be nice and short and to the point. Um, and not every Go project needs to mention Go. If it's a client, like uh, AWS client for Go, that makes sense. Go, AWS, cool. 
Uh, otherwise, I don't think we need to, to do it. And even in that case, right, if you import a package called AWS, you know, it's in Go. That's sort of enough, I think, for you to remember that this is a Go project. Give your project a logo or a mascot. I can't stress <laughs> how surprising the uh, response to um, your code. I forgot how I started that sentence, so I can't, I can't express. How, I can't express. I was very surprised. Fooled man can't be fooled twice. Um, I, I don't listen to that statistic. I made it up. It's falling apart, isn't it, guys? <laughs> No, it's not. It's going well. Don't look at me like that. It's going well. OK, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm not kidding, though, right? A project with a logo just gets, is, I don't know why, some emotional buy-in or something. Uh, and, and it's just a great way to have some fun. And we're gonna, I'm going to prove this to you now. We're going to play a little game that I like to call Name That Project. Um, so I want you to shout out. This is audience participation. And people at home on YouTube, I don't care where you are, shout it out, please. Uh, I'm going to show you a logo, and you tell me what the project is. And this, the point of this is to show you that uh, the, the logo helps remember the project. So we'll start with an easy one. <laughs> what about this one? Hmm? Buffalo. Is it Buffalo or Go Buffalo? Oh, OK. Good point. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, this one might be a bit tough. Gorilla. Yes, it's a gorilla. What's the project? Gorilla. gorilla Toolkit. Correct. Yeah, we probably everyone in this room has used this actually, and and it's a bit of an uh, you know it's an, uh, it's not a very prominent logo, so it sort of speaks to my point, which is um, you know y you well I don't know forget it. This one. Right. Yeah. Anyone at the back want to join in? No, nope, that's fine. Yep, that's Travis. This one's one of my favorites. Correct. What about that? Got some, got some programmers in. OK, might be a bit tough. Anyone know this? Hmm? NSQ. Yeah. No? Yeah. <laughs> All right, tough one. I'll go. <laughs> Hugo. Uh, uh, the the t-shirt, the the logo on the t-shirt. Not the not the gopher, not the gopher as me. The the little t-shirt. What's that? Come on guys, join in. It's not fun if you just GitHub. Yes, get her. Brilliant. Cool. Um, OK, that was good, wasn't it? That's <laughs> really good, that bit. OK, uh, computers can help too. Computers. There are tools which will help. Uh, you know, you can run GoLint, GoVet. There's a MetaLinter, which kind of runs all of them. And you can, you can have this running every time you save and every time you run your tests and things, so that you see um, quite early, you start seeing things like, "Oh, this this exported thing should be should have a comment," you know. And if you if you don't do the comments in in the kind of standard way, it'll prompt you to that as well. Then it'll say, "Yeah, you know, we we start the comment with the method name generally, so do that." Um, and there's also Go Report Card, which is quite cool. And this this is essentially a service that runs essentially the the MetaLinter, gives you a um, a breakdown and a score. And you can see here that, um, that there's some lint problems in, in Vice when I ran it. So I only got 93% of that. But otherwise, pretty good. And uh, this, this kind of helps. It's, it, it seems maybe it's kind of gamifying it a little bit. But the value in this is um, it, you, if, if this is a high scoring project. It means that the, 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 the person, it's going to be familiar to you, first of all. Comet, it's going to be well documented. There aren't going to be strangeness. There aren't going to be strange things like underscores in, in names and, and stuff like that. You know, it'll catch, it'll catch that, kind of, that kind of stuff. And if we want to be self similar um, and build a code base that we can pick up and, and use easily, then, then this is, this is, these are all valuable 
things. So, how do you spot a quality package then? Do they, did they use uh, GoFund? If, if not, then that's... Imagine seeing Go code that's not formatted now. That would be very strange. And you probably wouldn't have much confidence in it. Rightly or wrongly, it may be a brilliant package, but that's a thing to test, to, to consider when you look at it. Test files. Does it, are there any test files? If not, not going to be happy. Probably not very confident that this thing's going to do what, it, what we expect it to do. Um, yeah, are they using Java names? Big, big, long descriptions or Ruby, where in Ruby you can just write um, any method you want. You just write it like as a sentence with underscores and it works, which is amazing. But uh, it doesn't really, it's not really a Go thing. We don't have, uh, you know, catch all methods and things like that. And finally, uh, how many dependencies does it have? Um, and the fewer, the better, probably, because you know, there's less baggage coming along with that, with that package. Um, you know, if it just has the standard library, it, it's, you're probably going to use it with a bit more confidence, especially as we're still figuring out dependency management and things like that. Um, it, you sort of avoid the problem if there's no dependencies. Obviously, not always possible, um, again, but fewer is better. I've said less is better. That's, that's not even correct English. That's embarrassing. Fewer is better. Sounds worse, doesn't it? Um, bye. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. So, do, do, uh, I, we don't normally do questions, but I do have five minutes. So, if there's any questions or anyone wants to show us how smart you are, or anything I've said that you don't agree with, I'd actually genuinely like to hear that one. Not from you, Ernesto, obviously. <laughs> Too, too common. But, oh, we have a question. Brilliant. Oh, no. Why are we doing questions? <laughs> Come on, then. No? Okay. Sorry. What's your favorite package? Favorite package? Outside of the standard library. Um... Well, inside the standard library, probably Sync. I love Sync. I, I do. Sync, brilliant. Um, outside of it, well, I'm trying to think of ones I use all the time. Yes, that's a great one. Uh, the errors, Dave, Dave Cheney's errors package. I do like that. That, I predict, is going to be in the standard library at some point. But we'll see. Good question. Nice question, right? Not hostile. Not having to go up my hairline. Do you know what I mean? We can all learn a thing or two from that. Any other questions? I can't see. Ah, uh, my book. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, it's still available. I didn't put it in the slide this time. Do buy it then. Go, thank you. That was a real question. Go, <laughs> go programming blueprints. And if in books, you can have Go in the title. I think it's okay in books. Otherwise, just be programming blueprints. Should be weird. All right, I think I'm done then. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good conference. <laughs>